Good morning. Today's scriptures are uh, from two different passages, and uh, we'll be reading from Luke and reading from Matthew today. Would you please stand as you're able as we receive God's word? Luke 21, 1 through 4. While Jesus was in the temple, he watched all the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, she has given everything she has. And then Matthew 6, 25 to 34. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, but God the provider feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to God than those birds? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, God will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. They dominate our thoughts. But God, the abundant provider, already knows all our needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and you will receive everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. May the Holy Spirit make our hearts receptive and allow the truth in these words to penetrate and take root and grow into deep trust abundant, joy-filled living, and wholehearted giving. You may be seated. Well, good morning, folks. This is one of those um, Seahawks early kickoff Sundays, you know what I mean? They're in the eastern time zone, New Orleans, and uh, so that means the game kicked off about 40 minutes ago, which is also my way of saying... If you get the score, keep quiet about it, all right? Because we do have people who are recording the game, okay? And, uh, you know, they want to watch it like it's happening live, okay? So they don't like it when people tell what's going on. Right, Laura? All right. Something like that happened around here once. I'm the one who blabbed. Anyway, let's, uh, let's keep moving on here. Um, hey, you notice we're a little bit higher up today. Did you notice that? We're closer to heaven. Um, we, uh, we did a little renovation here in the front. Actually, one of the things I said about, great about having Pastor Leslie on board, I mentioned this Tuesday night at our congregational meeting, kind of brings a fresh set of eyes to everything we do and, you know, sometimes offers us insight. He said, just out of curiosity, how come we don't preach, speak from the highest level here? And we were telling him, you know, we used to, when I first came here 29 years ago, we had this huge pulpit, and uh, it had legs that were calibrated, you know, so that you were always at this level, but you couldn't get out and walk around it, you know, so we couldn't wander around much. Um, now that we're way up here, that first step's a long one, I got to be careful, man alive. And uh, we're all, we're having kind of little bets about who's going to be the first one to fall off of this. So anyway, um, I said, well, you know, there's all this musical equipment here, and it'd be kind of hard for the preacher to walk around and that kind of thing. So I talked to Roger Yerzik, and he built us this speaking platform here, and then some guys came in, and they put carpet on it. So we're going to try this for a while and see if we like it. The good thing about it is the sight lines are better, particularly from the back and in the balcony. So here we are. Um, I... Uh, also, uh, I just wanted to ask you, wasn't it good to see Pastor Leslie in the worship band this morning? Did you know that? that was, yeah, yeah, that was awesome. That's the first time we got in on that. I'm waiting for you to sing a solo, and I know it'll be good. 
And uh, before I do get uh, rolling here, too, I want to introduce a friend of mine, Mark Severson, longtime covenant pastor, colleague in ministry. Uh, Mark pastored a church called Hillcrest Covenant in the Kansas City area. Now he works in the covenant offices in our Serve Globally initiative in Chicago. Mark, would you stand up and just let us welcome you here. We're glad he could be here. Out in Seattle for the weekend and just let me know a couple weeks ago and said, hey, I'll be there. So uh, we're glad to have you, Mark. Glad you can be here. Well, we're starting uh, today a uh, three-week mini-series entitled Giving with an Attitude, okay? Now, you may remember last August I preached a short series called Serving with an Attitude, and that worked out so well, I thought, well, I'm just going to keep it going, Giving with an Attitude, and I'm even planning Praying with an Attitude, and I'll probably do one called Witnessing with an Attitude. I mean, I'm just going to get as much as I can out of this, okay? Okay. Sometimes when we use the word attitude, we may not mean something positive by it. I do, but you know how it goes. Sometimes when you say somebody's got an attitude, it's like, well, you know, they got a chip on their shoulder or something like that. But other times it's used in a very positive way. I've heard it said that Russell Wilson plays the quarterback position with an attitude, that he's got this fierce determination, you know, and um, he's got this confidence about him, and it inspires others. And that's really the way I'm using the word, okay? Giving with that kind of an attitude that just wants to honor and trust and be committed to God. If you've been around KCC for a few years, you know that in the fall, late fall, I always preach a short series on financial stewardship. And I do that to get us all pumped and primed and prayed up for the giving that we're going to do in the year to come to support God's kingdom work in all of the ways that it goes forward through Kent Covenant Church. Now, I'm going to tell you very honestly, I look forward to this series. I always learn a few things, you know, when I dig into the Scripture, and I always find some new inspiration for the giving that Michelle and I do. And I'm all, I also always get a lot of positive feedback about this series that I do each fall. And I think that's because, you know, all of us kind of want to know what God's looking for from us. And uh, we want to be inspired, and we want some direction when it comes to how God wants us to give. We uh, are starting just a, a week earlier on the series than I usually do, and that's because of the timing of the trip that Michelle and I will take to Nepal. Now, we'll be here next Sunday, and I'll preach the second series in the message, and then Pastor Leslie is going to wrap it up with a message on November 13th, and that'll also be when we distribute the Faith Promise commitment cards, and you take those home, and you pray over them, and then we'll bring them back and present them to the Lord the following Sunday. You may have noticed Pastor Leslie's only been here four months, but I am not refraining from giving him lots of heavy lifting to do, okay? So wrapping up the series is going to be a big deal. He always does a great job, by the way, of uh, preaching and speaking, so we're just delighted to have him on board. So to get the series started, I want us to look at this um, marvelous story. I, I find it to be challenging and charming at the same time. Luke chapter 21, you heard it read. This is the one where this poor widow puts a very small amount of money in the offering plate, a couple of coins. I mean, it might be like a couple of quarters. And yet Jesus says she gave the biggest gift of anybody that passed by that day to make their offerings. And Jesus says her gift was bigger because of the sacrifice it represented. And she shows us just such a great example of what it means to trust God. Jesus says this was all the money she had. And folks, when you give away your last dollar, I mean literally your last dollar, that shows a lot of trust in God. I want to offer three observations about giving that I see in this story. Here's the first one. God sees what we give. God sees what we give. Now, I know some of you are going, well, you know, that's pretty obvious. God sees and knows everything. Yes, that's true. But isn't it also true that even though God sees everything we do and He sees our giving, that we often don't live as if God is really seeing everything we do? You know what I'm talking about? 
I mean, it's true of all of our conduct, the way we live our whole life in following Christ. We say, you know, God sees, God knows, God's watching, and then we almost live like, you know, God's turned his back or he doesn't care or he's not paying attention. In other words, what I'm saying is we're kind of careless in the way we live a lot of times, and that's also true about the way we give. Too many otherwise well-intentioned followers of Christ end up being careless in giving. And what does that look like? Well, maybe it's just giving from what's left over, if there is anything left over at the end of the month. It's not planned. Or maybe it's just giving only on impulse. You know, something has to reach out and grab us by the lapels before we're really going to get involved and give to it. Or, you know, maybe it's just sort of nominally giving. There's not really any sacrifice involved, the way there was sacrifice involved for this woman. Now, I want to tell you this. One of the most powerful aspects of this story is really easy to overlook. It's the context in which it comes. There's a chapter division right before this story, you know, chapter 21, and it kind of gives us the impression that this happens sort of in isolation, everything else Jesus had been talking about before this. Nothing could be further from the truth. Remember, Luke did not put that chapter division in there, okay? Those chapter divisions were added in like the 1400s to make the Bible easier to study, all right? So when Luke wrote this, it's just one continuous story from what he had been talking about before. And what had he been talking about? Well, he'd been doing some teaching, warnings in many ways, about that group of people we sometimes refer to as scribes, or here they're called teachers of the law. I think that's a good description for them. And I don't think the uh, NLT did a really great job of translating verse here, uh, one here. They kind of uh, par- paraphrased a little bit. Uh, Luke did not actually write while Jesus was in the temple. I mean, they wanted to underline that, and that is true. Here's what he wrote. When Jesus looked up. When Jesus looked up, he saw this widow putting her final two coins in the offering. Now, what did he look up from? Well, he'd been doing this teaching about the pride and the arrogance of the teachers of the law. They were spiritual leaders in Israel, right? And here are some of the things he says about them. They love to prance around wearing impressive robes so everybody will notice them. And they love receiving uh, distinguished greetings when they're out in public. They love being called reverend and most reverend and your holiness and all of that kind of thing. They loved seats of honor in the synagogues and they loved sitting at the head tables for banquets. You get the picture. And then Jesus lowers the boom on him. Here's what he says. Yet they shamelessly cheat widows out of their property. Yet they shamelessly cheat widows out of their property. In other words, these highly revered spiritual leaders, and they're like legends in their own minds, have no compassion for the most vulnerable people in Israel's society, widows. And they also have no integrity because they're cheating these widows. They're taking advantage of them. Must have been a rash of that going on in Israel at the time for Jesus to talk about it. But here's what I want us to see. As he looked up from this teaching he'd been doing, what did he see? He couldn't time this any better if he tried, and I don't think he tried. I think this was a God thing. He saw a poor widow putting her final two coins in the offering. And he could have said, speaking of widows, check out what this widow just did. And Jesus was drawing a contrast between the widow and the teachers of the law. And you notice that Jesus commended her for what she gave. And the point is, her heart was in the right place, which was not true of these spiritual leaders, these teachers of the law. In other words, what really counts with God, and it's always actions over words, what really counts with God is that this widow has shown herself to be more spiritual than the spiritual leaders of Israel, than the teachers of the law. And she's shown it 
by the way she was willing to give. Folks, God pays attention to what we give just like Jesus was paying attention to the offerings people were bringing that day. Now, I'm not saying there's anything ominous or fearful about that. There shouldn't be. We know that God deals with us in grace. But grace is not something we're supposed to take for granted or exploit like, you know, God deals with me in grace, so it doesn't matter what I give, whether I give. No. No, grace comes with some obligations, not about how we receive it. It's called grace because it's free. But there are obligations that go with how we respond to the grace that God shows us. Think of this and write this down. Everything we do in serving God, everything we do in serving God, including our giving, is a response to how good and gracious God has been to us. Our giving is a response to the goodness and the love of God in our lives. And this widow shows us what real and deep trust in God looks like. She used her money, what little she had left, to live out her faith commitment and make an offering to God. Giving with trust. It's also what Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, that comes to us in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And no doubt is something Jesus spoke as a sermon and then those themes just keep reappearing in his teaching. We heard some of it this morning. I, I want to just uh, repeat a couple of verses. Matthew 6, starting at verse 25. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? That's a passage about trust. If we live by trust in God, which is really the meaning of the word faith in the Bible, all right, the closest synonym to faith is trust. God will, not God might, God will take care of us. It's a pledge and a promise that he's made. Here's the next one. God measures what we give. God measures what we give, and he measures differently than we do. I want you to listen to verse 3. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them. How is that possible? Two small coins? This poor widow has given more than all the rest of them. It's possible because God doesn't look at the amount in determining whether our gift was small, medium, or large. He doesn't say, wow, you gave $10,000 to the church, or you gave $100,000 to the church, or you gave a million dollars to the church. God measures by what kind of sacrifice is involved. See, it's not only about what we give, it's also about what we keep. And it's only when we have the courage, and I believe that's what it takes. It's only when we have the courage to look at giving from God's perspective that we'll give the way God wants us to give. Jesus exalted and praised this widow because she gave in such a sacrificial way and such a trusting way. Now, I do not believe the point here that Jesus is trying to make is that we should all be like the widow and we should give every dime we've got, we should empty our bank accounts, break open our piggy banks, drain our IRAs, and give it all away to God's causes. I don't believe that's the point. That would be an irresponsible interpretation. But we are supposed to draw inspiration from this widow's example. This story is supposed to challenge us to get on board with God and to begin to measure our gifts the way God measures our gifts with a focus on the sacrifice involved. See, God's not impressed by the amount that we give. He's impressed by the trust in Him our gifts represent. And that leads me to the last one. 
Here it is. God evaluates the meaning of what we give. I want you to think deeply about this. God evaluates the meaning of what we give. What I mean is that God sees the connection between our giving and the condition of our hearts. And Jesus established that there is a connection between the wealth that we manage and our giving. What did he say? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you put a lot of money into something, you care about it. Isn't that right? And you think about it. Folks, truly sacrificial gifts never come from stingy hearts, all right? Truly sacrificial gifts never come from stingy hearts. Jesus praised this widow for her gift, but I want you to notice what else he did. He offered a critique of the gifts of the others, didn't he? Listen to this. Talking about the others that he saw put offerings in, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus. More literally, it says, they gave out of their abundance. That's the word that's used. They gave out of their abundance. In other words, after they made their offering, they still had plenty. Plenty left over. They gave what they knew they could afford and not really miss. That was the idea. They wouldn't really miss it. But where's the sacrifice in that? Where's the trust in that? Giving can be a deeply spiritual and faith-building experience, which is what God wants it to be, okay? Now, one of the things I like about tithing, which God set up for his people in ancient Israel as kind of a beginning point for their giving, all right? And he added things on top of the tithe. But one of the things I like about it is it calls us to maintain a relationship between our earning, our income, and are giving. Here's the problem with the tithe. And by the way, Jesus did affirm the tithe and the practice of tithing in his teaching. But he and most of the apostles thought many people had the ability to go way beyond the tithe in their giving. You see, for those who have a lot, tithing is not really sacrificial. It is for some, but not for all. And that's why in the New Testament you get such an emphasis on giving in ways that are sacrificial, that go beyond the tithe. Now, I think it's good if we just step back for a minute and kind of look at our own lives and, you know, think about who we are and where we are, what makes our lives what they are. Many of us here, and I do realize it's not all, I, I talk to a lot of people in the congregation, you know, as in, during the week, and as the weeks go by, so what I'm saying is not true of everybody, but it is true of most of us in this church. We're blessed with a kind of abundance that is common to what is referred to as middle-class America. All right? Here in Kent, we live in a very stable community, uh, an ethnically diverse community. I mean, it's a wonderful community because of how diverse it is. It's not just some bland you know, single ethnicity community. I mean, we got people from all over the world here. That's a wonderful gift to live in that kind of a community. Our homes, you're going to go home, the vast majority of you, to a house that is warm. It's not cold because somebody couldn't pay the bill and there's no electricity and there's no heat. Our homes are warm. They keep us dry. We have food on our tables, and we have food in our pantries. We have reliable cars to drive. Maybe they're not fancy, but they get us where we're going. They're reliable. We have so many different kinds of entertainment at our fingertips, all kinds of options. We have hobbies that we're able to fund. Many of us are able to help our children get through college. Maybe we can't pay it all. Maybe we, you know... Not able to do that, but we at least can give them a little bit of help. And most of us can occasionally manage an out-of-state or an even out-of-country 
vacation, occasionally, we can manage something like that. In other words, most of us really do have a lot. As a matter of fact, you read statistics, you know, and if you're in what is called middle-class America, um, did you know that you're among the 2% wealthiest people who have ever lived on the face of planet Earth? That's how blessed we are. Whenever we give, God pays attention to what our gifts mean in the context of our lives. What kind of hearts do they come from? Do they come from hearts that are completely surrendered to Him? That was the widow's heart. Or do they come from hearts with all these competing agendas for what's going to be in first place? You know, you heard that scripture. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Everything else you need will be taken care of. Do they come from hearts with passion for His church, for the body of Christ, for the witness for Christ that the church is charged and given the responsibility for making in the world and taking this good news to the whole world, this good news of Jesus, God's love, God's forgiveness? Or do they come from hearts that are lukewarm, hearts that just want to check the box that says, I gave. You know, when I put these uh, messages together, I often like to, um, to interview people or to ask people to come forward and tell a little bit of their story, their journey in giving. And so I was praying about this, and um, I felt like God laid it on my heart to uh, ask somebody who's been in our church for a long time uh, just really faithful to the whole life of the church, and that includes giving. So I asked Dave and Barb Bush if they would come forward and just share a little bit of their perspective on giving. Dave and Barb, would you guys come on up, and could we welcome them? Yeah. Thank you for coming and sharing a little bit of your story. Yeah. Um, so we just want, I just want to cover a couple of basics first, all right? Um, just for the record, how long have you attended KCC? 39 years. 39 years. Did you hear that? Isn't that awesome? Step up just a little bit. Uh, and, you know, here's what's really amazing about that. That means they have survived me for 29 years, okay? <laughs> awesome, you guys. Yeah. You don't have to tell the whole story. All right. Um, and in that... 39 years, which is fantastic. Uh, what are some of the servant leadership positions you have held here over the years? And I know the list is long, so you don't have to say them all, but just a few. I have been a Sunday school teacher over the years, um, done a lot of behind the scenes kind of things, and presently am the volunteer coordinator of the Benevolence Ministry. Great. So you're real active and busy this time of year in benevolence. Thanksgiving baskets, yes. Putting together those Thanksgiving <laughs> baskets, and after that it'll be the Christmas baskets. Okay. How about you, Dave? I've had the opportunity to be uh, church chairman and vice chairman, uh, uh, adult Sunday school, uh, student Sunday school, a few things. The list keeps going. That's great. So as you look back, and in addition to the ongoing ministries of the church, which I know you've given generously to support, what are some of the causes KCC has sponsored or participated in that you've given to? Just what are some of the additional things? Well, from the time we first uh, attended back in 1977, missions has been just a, a very strong thing that our church has been founded on. Uh, and we've had the privilege to grow from the little house on the prairie over here into the wonderful church home now. Uh, we've also been able to help with uh, missions in Congo, China, uh, Mexico, and uh, that's one of the legacies I believe the Lord has provided us with here. Uh, that We had a couple generations that we followed in that were good teachers to us, and we, we saw them give generously and uh, and rubbed off on it. I think a big thing is when we started here, it was just the little building over there where the student center is, and it's been exciting to see the building projects that have occurred here and how the church is so open to so many more people because of what's happened here. Yeah, it's been amazing to see all of that develop and ways that we're able to reach out to the community exactly. 
through that. So uh, how do you go about discerning how much to give to support the ongoing ministries of the church and then the special offering projects on top of that? Well, I think that uh, first uh, we reflect on what God's done for us, uh, which is much, and uh, then uh, prayer and uh, over our 50 years of marriage, uh, we uh, oftentimes have done this separately and come together, and it's amazing how the Lord has brought us to the same amount or figure or whatever to support something or not support something. And I think we trust our leadership here to bring up issues like um, Advent conspiracy and so many other areas. We feel real strongly, though, that our tithe goes to our church, and then these other things are offerings that we, we uh, look into our funds to see if we can help, and God has blessed us very much that so we can do that. And I think as a church, we're blessed to be a part of our covenant denomination that provides us so many really great missions opportunities to jump on board with, and then some of the ways that um, we've been blessed to be called into ministry in our community. Uh, just to have some great, great opportunities. So here's what I would want to ask, and for the sake of everybody here, what advice would you give to young people who want to develop good giving habits and have healthy attitudes toward giving? Um, I think the thing that hit me when we, as Dave said, we've been married for 50 years. Back when I was pregnant with our oldest son, I started attending Women's Bible Study Fellowship. Um, and at that time, we were studying the Minor Prophets, and we studied the book of Malachi. And the verse Malachi 3.10 really hit me. Bring into the storehouse all your tithes, and then God will open the gates of heaven. And you will not be able to hold all the blessings that will come down. And um, at that time, I saw that as a call to really be obedient and God has been so faithful over all these years. So I, I guess my thing is just trust that God is going to fulfill his promises. And I would add to that just, and there are many ways to do this, but what's worked for us is we have one savings account, one checking account. It, I know today when many people, both husband and wife, have to uh, work or a young person just starting out that may not be married, uh, it's my money and your money, and we've been blessed not to uh, get into those issues. It's God's money, and it's a gift from God, and we look upon it uh, that way. Uh, and therefore, the first thing we do is uh, give the Lord his money out of our monthly income, and then we decide, you know, we pay the bills after that, and the Lord has blessed us. There's always been more than enough at the end to get us through. Just amazing things in our life that uh, are God things where that's occurred. You've seen and experienced God's faithfulness. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And you've seen the ways that giving for the work of God's kingdom really comes back to and you. But raised four kids yeah. doing that. And so it makes a, and, and it, just, it just has a huge impact yeah, in the faithful. world. Thank you so much. Let's uh, show our appreciation to Dave and Barb. I just want to launch us, you know, into a time of prayer where we're just really putting what God has given us before him and asking him how he wants to direct us in our giving for the year to come. Let's pray together. God, thank you for the rich truth of your word. One of the ways you bless our lives is with truth that comes from your word. Uh, marvelous stories that you use to teach us and that are inspirational in their own right. Who would have thought a, a poor widow giving away her last two coins, thinking that what she gave would go totally unnoticed, should end up teaching centuries worth and generations of Christ followers what it means to give sacrificially to you. And Lord, we just lift up before you our giving. You've given us so much. We want to we wanna honor you. We want to give to you in a way that honors you. We want your word to go forward powerfully in the year to come. We want your love to be shown through us 
in word and in deed. So guide us and direct us, Lord. We thank you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.